Okay, well, let's uh, let's get started. We have uh, 35 minutes. Um, so, so welcome everyone. Uh, let me introduce myself. So I'm, I'm Peter Reinbeek, Associate Professor of Health Data Science at the Erasmus Medical Center. Um, and I'm leading together with, with Jenna, uh, the work group or the, the part of the PLP, PLP, PLE PLP work group related to the uh, prediction modeling uh, side of, uh, of the story. And I think, Jenna, can you introduce yourself uh, quickly? Hi, yeah, I'm, so um, my name is Jenna Reps. I'm at Janssen and I'm heavily involved in the patient and prediction uh, working group at Odyssey. Great. So, so welcome everyone. I think um, what's nice about these like community uh, breakouts is that uh, it's also an opportunity for us to, to get to know you. And of course we have those work group meetings where we have a really dedicated team focusing on prediction. And, and I know many of you are actually not in that group. So this call is also an opportunity to ask for any type of questions related to the patient or prediction work that we are doing in Odyssey. So feel free to jump in at any time. And also, uh, if you have any good ideas or you're working on stuff in this field, just also let us know. So we'll, we'll open us up some time for that. Um, the other idea that uh, we had with this call is to brainstorm a bit about potential topics for research agenda for 2021. Um, and uh, that also we can get can benefit from input from from everybody uh, in this call. So just to remind me on, on uh, remind us all on where we are with Odyssey and what our mission is. Uh, we want to improve health by empowering a community to collaboratively generate the evidence that promotes better health decisions and better care. And I highlighted these three topics there: empowering community, generating evidence, and I would actually add reliable evidence there. Uh, and having impact on health decisions and better care. And I think it would be good uh, for us to brainstorm a little bit on where we are actually in this journey with patient error prediction. How successful have we been on those three different uh, main, main topics? And for those that are completely new, I just, um, I have one sli or two slides on the prediction work that we have been doing in Odyssey, and then we'll focus on those, uh, those open questions. It's definitely not the idea that I'm going to present many slides, so I have seven slides and that's the end of it and then we can start uh, this discussion. Um, I just want to highlight this one because I think this is the core of the patient level prediction work. Um, we aim to uh, predict something, of course, that happens in the future based on all the information that we have prior to some moment in time. And that anchor point can be anything, could be a disease and then predicts another outcome, or it could be predicting whether patients switch to another drug. So the framework that we built is very flexible to capture all these different types of prediction problems. Um, and uh, it really helped us to identify prediction in those three different questions. What's the target cohort that you're predicting? What's the outcome? And what's the time at risk? So the period in, in time that you want to predict in. Um, and we have built a package for that. Uh, and Jenna did an amazing job in that uh, mainly building a patient error prediction package in R that we can execute against the CDM. And you can read the paper. Uh, and there's also a chapter in the book of Odyssey that is uh, really about patient error prediction that you might find interesting if you're not uh, into this space yet. Um, we've been quite successful in uh, executing studies, uh, trying to answer clinical questions, and we've done a huge amount of methods research that's really out of scope to talk about here, but we can definitely uh, do that at another uh, another moment. What I would like to do here is, first of all, think about two things. Well, have we generated enough interest from others to actually start using our tools? And I think that's something that we can work on and that can definitely benefit from all your help, even though you're not in the patient or prediction work group. But if there are certain topics that you or clinical problems that you would have in mind and you would have a common data model, we really like to see the community take advantage of the tools. And I think we we have done many studies. We have been in the lead in many of the, those, and, and Jenna and I, but also a small group of other people. But we like to see this being more adopted by other data sources that are on the CDM. So before I move on, I, I would be interesting to learn from, from you if there's anybody in the team who is, is interesting interested in prediction in general and would see application of such a tool on their own data, and that could actually be a reason to join the group, for example. So someone who has ideas on this topic? Oh, I have some. Uh, my name is. Okay, go ahead. 
Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Adriana. I recently joined about a month or, or so ago, and I'm a PhD student specializing in epidemiology. So this is definitely uh, relevant to um, what I want to study, Great. what I'm working on. And do you also have data in the CDM? Do you, do you have a common data model in your institute? Right now in the CDM, like for this organization? No, I don't believe so. Um, okay. I, right now, the only data I have is the data that I'm working with with my major professors. All right. Uh, thank you. So was somebody else who wanted to speak? Yeah, go ahead. I'm Pascal Matioko, and uh, I work for Kaiser Permanente, and I try to introduce uh, policy to them. Um, so uh, I'm uh, basically al alone with uh, another person who work on the, the CDM and put uh, some data in that database. Uh, my side is uh, try is more oriented to the uh, prediction level, patient prediction level. Um, so since it's introducing that uh, that platform to the doctors and who may be interested in Kaiser, um, I have to demonstrate the validity of the platform and uh, the prediction capability of, the, uh, of, uh, of what Gina created. Right. That library. Right. Okay. So um, one challenge is uh, that uh, a doctor asked me is, okay, uh, we we get those COVID patients coming on the Kazu, okay, uh, and uh, how can I uh, give you a, a list of uh, like uh, uh, of patients who recently have been uh, diagnosed with COVID and predict how many gonna hit the hospital or how many will die or only be, uh, go to ICUs. Um, uh, and, uh, and okay, so that, that, uh, that's the, the yeah. business problem. Yeah. Okay, like that, uh, those people can uh, you know, planify their resources and, and so forth. Uh, well, that, that's, that's, that's great. And it's quite interesting topic. And we, we also uh, worked on that uh, within the, uh, the study a thon. So uh, we wrote a paper uh, on that topic that you definitely have to look into. It's the cover paper. And maybe we can add a link uh, later in the chat um, where okay, we built great. a topic. Uh, well, right. built that model, you could try it out. It's also okay. interesting to know that, okay. that you are actually uh, talking about our package with others. And, and I, I guess there are many more people in the world that are doing that. We just simply don't know that. And it would be good to uh, to get a better insight in that and help those people as well to move forward with their prediction problems. Okay. Any, uh, anybody else? I'm not sorry. finished. <laughs> oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. So, sorry, taking so much time, but okay, no anyway. Um, so uh, my question is, is very specific. OK, let's say I create a model based on, you know, uh, 300,000 uh, folks out there who have been uh, have COVID and I create a great model with a nice AC, AUC, whatever it may be. OK, and now uh, a doctor come around and said, OK, uh, Pascal, look at uh, those 20 uh, cases, OK? and uh, give me a prediction on that based on the model you created. OK, so actually the way I understand the SAT platform works, I need to create basically two models and validate across those two models. So I have my best model with uh, several thousand of people there that create my model. Now I end up with 20 folks coming on the other side. If I create, how can I can create a model uh, uh, on those 20 folks and validate on my model. That's that's a question I, I would like to ask, because if I take only 20 people, what's going to be the level of, if my level of incidence is below 25, <laughs> the model um, stops. It, it doesn't work. So uh, that's my question. So it's very practical, basically. I'm not sure. Do you I understand? Do you understand? I'm not sure. I completely okay. understand. Maybe I'm not think... clear enough. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. I, I think no, what you're okay. trying. <laughs> I think well, 
maybe we can take this offline. If you just uh, send send me a, a text message or a message in the chat, we can follow up on that specific problem uh, instead of using it now in this this call, doing it in the call. Um, okay, is there anybody else? Maybe a general command on IDs for work that they would like to do on their own data. Yeah, this is uh, Ron Herrera. I'm working for Bayer Pharmaceuticals. We are working on the one AMI project on prostate cancer. And nowadays we, we are going to start a studiathon on, on the topic in March. And yeah. one part of the studiathon is we wanted to do some prediction models uh, for prostate cancer patients. Uh, yeah. So AMI project, and then we will we have to work a lot on this. And we have plenty of relatively a lot data sets that we have to we would like to work on so that's why Great. I enjoy this yeah well thanks a lot for sharing that that would be definitely be a topic to share with the broader community after the study line I know we are from Eden also involved in that so great yeah. to see that happening mm -hmm. um thanks thanks a lot so yeah, I think in, in general, we, we did a good job with, with that whole, uh, well, the package and, and empowering the community. We just need to see more uptake and also see more papers from others. Ideally, some that Jenna and I are not co-author on, uh, that people have utilized the tools. And I think that's something we could put in our OKRs that we like to see in 2021, that that happens more. And we should probably facilitate that uh, as best as we can. So. What I what I like to uh, do next is uh, talk to this this specific slide that uh, Patrick has created for Odyssey in general to create reliable evidence, and he he nicely shows the desired attributes for that, and I think it would be useful to see where we actually are with the patient error prediction framework and how much of this did we tackle already and where is there opportunity for additional research. So the first component of reliable evidence is that it should be repeatable. I mean, if I run the same study on my, on my data, I should get the same results. I think we covered that because we have a nice pipeline of tools that uh, we can run as long as we keep track of all our versions correctly. We are able to, uh, to repeat an analysis quite nicely. Um, also, reproducibility, I think, is kind of covered with, uh, with the pipeline because I should be able to give you the package and run it against my own uh, CDM and we should still get the same results. So I think that has been facilitated in the work that we've been doing in the last couple of years uh, quite nicely, I would think. Replicability is an interesting one. So there you have similar data and you expect to have similar results. And um, not all of you may be aware of that, but we've, we have implemented some nice functionality in the package that you can build a model and then share that model, model with others and ask them to replicate uh, that, uh, that study on their own data. Um, so I think that is there. What is a challenge still, I think, is uh, if we are building models that generalize well to other databases. And there's quite a lot of opportunities, I think, for research in this space to think about how can we optimize for generalizability, meaning that uh, we build models that work on other data, other type of databases that are not exactly or not too similar to our own. Uh, and that is something that, that we could think about as a priority in 2021 to facilitate that more, and that could be on different levels. One component could be uh, to have a library, at least of all the models that we have developed in Odyssey, and like the phenotype library, but have a patient level prediction library where all the models are in all, and all the performance measures on the databases that have been, uh, have been uh, that the model has been uh, used for, um, but then allow the community to run it on their own data and send back the results in that, in that uh, tool. <clears throat> So that's more about facilitating generalizability. Uh, but I also think there are some topics or research topics that we can think about in generalizability and, and trying to optimize that. For example, only building models on variables that are available in multiple databases and see what the impact would be of that choice on the performance of the models. And that that and there are I think, multiple options. And I'm sure, Jenna, you can also help brainstorming a bit about that. Um, the, the final thing is ro robustness. So how robust are we? If we make small changes in the analysis, like changing the number of trained test splits or the look back period, or whether we include all the different data domains or not, what is the impact on the model performance and 
and maybe even the generalizability of the model. So I think there's there's quite some work that we can do. And uh, I know maybe Jenna, you can talk a bit about what you've been doing in that space already with looking at the uh, the train test splits, for example, or maybe the look back periods and other things. But there may be some nice opportunities to work on and to think about in the patient level prediction working group in that respect. Jenna, anything to add uh, from your side on that? Um, no, so I think it's a nice summary, unless you want me to expand now on any, anything. Or... Well, maybe you can expand a bit, bit on the robustness research that you've uh, started, like the, the train test splits and all that stuff. Yeah, so so we kind of started last year, really looking at the different options, um, like subjective choices you can make when you when you develop a prediction. So one of them would be um, the design, whether you do a case control versus a cohort design. Uh, one would be how you do the internal validation. So are you getting the internal validation from a, a test set? Are you doing it from cross validation? Um, are you just doing it on the whole data, which hopefully not? Um, but there's different choices you can make. Um, how do you deal with censoring? Um, what sort of covariates are you putting into the model? So we kind of like went through and, and thought about different different points in the prediction kind of design where you have to make some subjective choice. And we started investigating like what's the impact of that choice. So if we make a small change, if we, if, if, if we, if we change the design, if we change the way we're doing internal validation, if we change our features, um, how does that have an impact on uh, like the performance of the model? Um, but another question which we could be asking, which we haven't really looked at, is how does that impact the actual model itself? So how stable are, for example, the logistic regression co uh, coefficients um, based on like making a, a small change? So I think there's, there's there's quite a lot of questions that we've got. There's there's, there's quite a lot of questions to ask. Um, we've got some answers in terms of performance. We haven't necessarily got them in terms of like how stable your models are. Um, there's also the question, is this the same across models? So um, we've been doing some research in terms of logistic regression, but the, um, the, the, the things we're learning might not transport over to gradient boosting machines um, or, or other types of models as well. So I think we've got a lot of questions there, which is quite exciting for, for methods research and hopefully going to give some people some insights when they're designing a prediction. What is the, the kind of potentially best option you can pick uh, depending on your prediction problem? If you can get yeah. insights. Yeah, what's nice about this type of work is that um, we we have been trying to publish uh, a lot of papers actually in the last period, and we often get feedback from the reviewers that they say, for example, uh, you should not use age groups because that that has a bad impact on the performance of your model. You should never do that. And people are, have very strong opinions. The reviewers of the papers and they say no to the paper, and then we think, well. You say this, but you actually have not really done a lot of, well, not at a large scale research on the impact of those choices. And I think we, there's an opportunity for us to do that. And, and uh, Jenny also looked into that a bit already, what the effect would be on uh, on using a 10 year age groups or having a continuous age as a variable. And all these questions, I think we can really help. And then not only the Odyssey community, but the broader machine learning community. Uh, because we have the nice common data model in place and we can do some uh, some analysis at large scale. There's a question from somebody. Uh, Chen, yes, go ahead. Hey guys, this is Ray. Um, I, uh, Ray, hi. I just, hi. Um, I think it's really interesting the work you're doing around robustness and certainly thinking about hyperparameters and, and tune them and optimizing. Uh, but just to check, we don't necessarily, like the pay, part of the slide where it says similar on the bottom right. Like we don't necessarily, that's not necessarily a goal of this, right? We wouldn't yeah, expect yeah, yeah, yeah. tuning these things to be similar, but instead it is the ultimate goal to try to either systematically test all of these possibilities across anytime you run a study, or would it be finding like an optimal starting point um, yeah. to try to figure out how we can create the best model? I think it's a combination of both. We definitely want to get to best practices and that should be driven by research instead of just opinions of people. So if we can if we can assess those things on data and then come up with best practices, like, like for example, uh, some work that have been done in, in my group on learning curves to answer the question, how much data do we actually need for a prediction model? Do we benefit from 100,000 patients if we already have 10,000 with, uh, with a certain outcome? Uh, and that, that research triggers us, oh, this might be the best practice. You need to at least have these numbers. Um, I do fully agree with you though, that the, the, the goal is not to make them identical, but at least to understand 
why they are not identical. And so, and that's nice about the CDM approach because you don't have the problem of the understanding of the, how the source data has been used, but you have the CDM, so you cover that part of the pipeline. But the last part is the analytical part, and there are still some questions, at least I have many questions on uh, how we can better assess whether this is actually not working on the database or that there would have been other options in the database that would make it work. Uh, so I think that that's the space that we are in uh, at the moment, at least that I'm thinking about. I hope that answers your question, Marie. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, another question from Mitchell. Yeah, <clears throat> um, so I'm, I'm mostly here to just sort of learn about what the prediction team is, is, is working on and learn more about yeah. it. Um, the generalizability issue, I, I feel like we're talking about um, heterogeneity between databases, which makes sense as a CDM um, group, why we'd be thinking about that. Is there interest sort of in temporal um, heterogeneity in prediction models? Like I'm thinking an obvious example would be the ICD-9-10 switch, but even COVID, you can imagine the prediction models might function differently given people's health consumption right now. Is that sort of in, yeah. of interest? I, I think it's a very interesting topic to see how that, how that impacts the prediction models, especially also when we get to the point where we put the prediction model into the clinical practice, we are actually changing clinical practice, right? And we, we have not been too successful in that step yet. But if we do that, it may require us also to update the model because things are changing. So I, I definitely think that's an interesting area. And yeah, changes in the healthcare system over time. And of course, we do have the trained test split where we have the future as the test split and the current time is trained, so like right. time splits. Uh, but there's much more research that we can do in that space if that's useful, yeah. Absolutely, and especially in a situation, for example, with the vaccines that we are in now and the COVID-19, initially we had the challenge that there was not enough COVID-19 data, but we still wanted to build a model. So we used a proxy uh, with, uh, with flu uh, the, uh, and then see whether that would actually transport to the COVID-19 situation. But over time, we got more and more COVID data. So yeah, we could use that uh, while training the model in some way. Interesting, yeah, thank you. Interesting topic, yeah. Um, Adriana, yeah. I have a quick question. So the model this is really fascinating. The model, do you look at just a linear perspective or are you looking on logistic and survival as well? Um, when you talk about some to generalize. It's, it's very, yeah, it's, it's very open. It's not really, that question I think is independent on the type of algorithm that we would use. Uh, but the, well, Jenna, you can talk about it, but the, the package has different types of algorithms in there, and even uh, Cox uh, proportional regression is also in there uh, at the moment. Okay. Yeah. That's so we awesome. tended to we started off with um, binary classification. So most of our metrics were binary classification based metrics, but we've recently started to add in survival models, and we've got some survival metrics now as well. So we can kind of support both of those at the moment. Oh, that's perfect. And this is all through R, right? Through G to help. Yes, although okay. although underneath there's also Python code, so we do interact with other systems, but the interface at least is in R uh, at the moment. Yes, okay. correct. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, somebody else? Yeah, so I, I don't know, Joe, yeah, uh, I needed to step back. My kids were, okay, anyhow. So <laughs> I <laughs> I don't know, you, you already spoke about this, Jenna, but there is one important uh, factor regarding what you were just mentioning about the splits, regarding that we're integrating data from EHR and claims. And the resolution for times are very, let's say, very different. And, and not just that, it's um, the, this, let, let's put it, these two different words about predicting something that happened when the patient is at the hospital is still at the hospital and predicting something when the patient already is outside. So the, this time windows and this resolution when I when I sort of need to order events within a single admission or when I don't care about the predicting something uh, uh, for a given admission, but predicting something like, I don't know, one month, two, three, four, five months. So I, I wanted just to hear your thoughts regarding some of that, because even there is a, even in this bigger discussion regarding CDN6 about this time resolution and what to do about that. So I don't know what we've been thinking about it. I don't, it's very related to how to split 
and the and the issues with time. So I, I just want to hear your thoughts regarding some of those uh, those aspects. Yes, I think we had a, a, a little chat on the Hades work group about kind of the addition of time in, in the CDM and how that could, could cause some issues because if someone's got missing time, um, it's kind of like, what do you do with that? Like, you don't know whether it occurred before or after. And like, do, like if we have um, a default time, like, how do you know if that's like kind of imputed or not? Um, so I think time is definitely going to be something that's um, that's going to be added into the CDM6, but I don't know if we're going to have any solutions for how to address that, especially with prediction, because you don't want to use stuff that occurred earlier. Like you, that makes it invalid. Um, so I think I haven't really thought too deeply about it, but I think that's definitely something that's going to be a problem. Um, I mean, the easiest thing would just be to ignore time and just keep at the date level. But then, like you said, you are kind of missing out on this kind of ordered, especially um, within a visit. Although I think a lot of times when we have visits, I'm not even sure how well the claims is never really going to have the time. So claims is always going to have this this issue, I think. Um, I guess if you do something separately for EHR data and something differently for claims data, then that could cause some issues as well. If you're kind of including time in one and not in the other, then that could impact the generalizability, for example. Um, so these are I've questions. Seen, I think. I've, I've seen a couple of databases now in our Eden exercises with, that do have time uh, really uh, our stems of prescriptions, but it's rare. And I, I, I wonder if we at the moment should put a lot of effort in, in that specific problem. I know our GP database don't, definitely don't have time information, um, but it might become interesting. I mean, if there's more and more database that have the information, then I think we should definitely look into that. Yes, so speaking for Stanford, and this may be true for a lot of uh, EHRs that are uh, with uh, with an EPIC, like with right. with EPIC, uh, time is available at a lot of granularity. So there is a tons of granularity on 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 time. So that exists, and that may be true for everybody that is running EPIC and extracting using this Clarity or Kaboodle databases. Um, and and also um, many institutions are already incorporating, uh, you know, data from sensors. And I do know, and it's even the case for Stanford, that some of the data we're getting, let's say flow sheets that are sometimes entered by the NORS, uh, actually some of them are actually entered automatically. So that resolution is already happening. And uh, what I can tell you that at least at Stanford, we're even getting this flow sheet data that <laughs> like let's say is is let's say hourly data. We're already getting them and we're populating the measurement. Right, right. <clears throat> so it it may be happening and maybe happen faster for that that we thought. So it's something that I'm very happy. We have had a, 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 our our lab many discussions around these issues with time and and with intra-hospital predictions or predictions that we want to do with whatever hospital data we have. So it's you know it's it's, it's still an ongoing topic for us. And everybody's asking me, like everybody just asked me, like, okay, what are you going to do with that in the CDM? So <laughs> I just right, right, right. Well, that's good. <laughs> so, I, I think I think that these these developments are driven by use cases. So if you have the use case, then uh, then we should definitely look into that at some point. So thank, thanks for sharing that. Um, if there are no, uh, Mitchell, you still have your hands, uh, your hand there. I think I answered your question. Or do you have another question? Yeah, okay, there you go. I do not. Thanks. Uh, okay, good. Well, the last uh, seven minutes, uh, I just want to uh, talk about one more topic that, that I'd like you to give some feedback on. So we talked about those first three red uh, words that I highlighted, and the last one is actually impact on, on health decisions and care. And now the question is, did, are we successful in that already? And I, I think that this is definitely an area that we can improve on. I, I think we have built many prediction problems, but how do we get these models into clinical practice and have, and have doctors actually use them is still something that yeah we have to, I think we have to improve on. And I'm, I'm kind of struggling with figuring out what the best approach would be to do that. Um, one one potential option could be that we link up with with a group of clinicians that have an actual prediction problem in their head, and want to solve that. Which happened a bit with COVID, I must say, and I was very happy to see that the uh, the cover algorithm was picked up by Spanish uh, health ministry, and 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 they they actually are supposed to be using it uh, for for uh, for triage of patients. 
but we need to do more of that. And I, I know, well, Danny, you're also in the call, and I know you, you've been suggesting many prediction problems that we do in rheumatoid arthritis, um, but we still need to bring them into clinical practice. And what, what are the steps there? And, and would that be some sort of target that we could aim for uh, for 2021 to at least have a couple of them being used in clinical practice? And any thoughts on that? And definitely, Danny, maybe you have some thoughts on this uh, since you are the clinician and applying these models. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, that's a very important topic, uh, Peter. And uh, I will say, unfortunately, at least until now, I don't think implementation or uptake of these models has been based on quality, but rather on other things like, you know, exactly. Exactly. PR and, you know, like uh, I think FRAX is an excellent example of something that's quite rubbish and completely opaque yeah. um you know nobody is i don't know if you're familiar but it's a fracture risk estimation that's been entirely opaque nobody knows the coefficients if you want to even validate it you have to pay the authors all thousands of pounds to to for them to calculate it for you because you cannot uh, really get the coefficient so you know and that still is one of the most widely implemented models that's even approved by NICE and you know National Osteoporosis Societies all over the world so I don't think it's been driven by quality but rather by that sort of thing um, I right. believe that um, that things you know times are changing um, and, and I think transparency is super important <clears throat> but I think also simplicity and kind of you know obtaining parsimonious models is something that of course clinicians always see as a very valuable um, contribution because if the model is very complex, you know, they don't see the way to use it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with you. That there is, but there is something, we're doing something not right uh, to get to that point. And, and that's, uh, yeah, Christian. Can I, uh, raise, I, I, raise your I know, hand. I have to raise. Uh, you raise your hand, that's good. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is, okay. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. Uh, so I, we may be a little um, too harsh with ourselves uh, because a successful model could be one that a doctor uses every day in order to make a decision on a patient. Um, or uh, it could be a model which has indirect effects. So for example, there are lots of models being built um, to detect rare diseases all the time. Um, it's a huge problem because you can't see them, because they are so rare that they're below the level that a doctor can form his or her own internal prediction model in his own um, uh, neural network. Um, and therefore, it doesn't get run. And therefore, you know, it doesn't happen. And these people are running around for years uh, not being properly uh, diagnosed. Um, then there are all sorts of prediction uh, models that are being built. And I see this from the side of, you know, from going around and seeing what the in industry does and uh, and what the, uh, the sometimes the, the regulators do. Um, the models that are being built uh, in order to see whether there is something, right? So run a predictive model in order to see whether there actually is something going on, so to speak, right? Uh, and then, of course, in the next step that they want, if they, as soon as they see there is something that can be predicted, they say, all right, now tell me what it is that makes it go. So that's the second job, which, by the way, is something that we may talk here about. Um, how do we decipher these models and actually come up with uh, um, a good way to disseminate uh, what makes, you know, what are the, the predictors and what are the relevant uh, covariates? But that's the second one. First one is there are these models um, going on. We shouldn't hide. They are also useful. Um, they also they are they are significantly contributing to uh, to what's you know what what happens to patients in the in the long run. Um, as long as we 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 can know them, we can invite these people and we can support them. Um, that actually would make a lot of sense. So you know, the well, doctor I, I, don't see yeah, that. No, I, I, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think there's definitely some kind of high level questions where patients in the end will benefit from. J just the question, can we even predict these outcomes on an electronic health record? So and we did that uh, way back uh, in, uh, a couple of years ago where we did it for, for depressive disorders or, or, major, or pharmaceutically treated uh, patients with depression, where we created those color plots where we actually showed that these outcomes we can simply not predict on the HR data. And that could help because then the focus could be from others also on those things that we can predict and help out with that. 
But what I what I really miss in the end is that the, those models that Dani mentioned, and and we know that they are used, and actually also uh, uh, the the chat two score is a good other example, right? That's been used by many, and many people are are struggling with this performance and. Why are these models in clinical practice and can we not get a couple of those into clinical practice? I think that is something that should be our ultimate goal because of our mission. But we need to figure out if that's a marketing thing, if we are not talking to, I don't think that the problem is that we don't have the right technical people and the expertise and team. I think we have that. But, but how do we reach those people? For example, I saw some things happening with COVID-19 where we did it from Odyssey perspective. We just build, start building models for COVID-19, while others actually started with interacting with people on the ICUs themselves and asked them what their questions were and worked together with them on building the models. And those models are actually being used in the hospitals that I know of. Well, even though I think these models could have been improved based on our approaches, which is kind of frustrating uh, to me, to say the least. The fact that we cannot get the cover the publication in a journal at the moment this is just you know, very annoying but this is also a um it's it's also in uh, how you frame the the problem uh, situation so first frame yep. is what's really a success does it have to be the doctor well i already said i don't think so yep, yep. Uh, the second one is when does a doctor actually want one right if it's trivial they say go away okay because I already know, right? They have to be old, and they have to be sick with, uh, you know, uh, uh, some respiratory stuff, uh, and then they're going to be doing bad in COVID. You don't, you don't have to. I, I got it. Okay, I don't need a predictive model. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, or there are these incredibly ridiculously complex ones where you need to spend money, and of course, the doctor says, you know, uh, that, that doesn't work for me. So there are few situations where you have the middle, the sweet spot. It's not trivial. And it's not uninterpretable. And then the other sweet spot is that a prediction actually is gives you a, a gain on something. So it has a therapeutic consequence and a significant therapeutic consequence. And so, for example, there are two ones, which I know, um, uh, where prediction is an extremely hot problem, but it's actually hard to solve, which is predicting um, high malignant and low malignant breast cancer and prostate cancer. So the guy, the, per the person, woman or man gets the cancer and only in four years you're going to know, was it a bad one, was it a good one? But what if it is going to be a bad one, you want to treat now. If it's a good one, you don't want to treat now because it's going to be awful for the poor guy or, or girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So very clear, huge advantage, makes a huge difference, the, pr the prediction as a therapeutic consequence. So you need two things. You need a therapeutic consequence and you yep. need... You need the balance between trivial and complex. Um, and it doesn't happen that often. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I like I like that. And it's, it's a direction that we try to, to get to a little bit when we started with the COVID-19, that we thought about a checklist or what are actually the requirements for a prediction model? What is the, why do you want, how do you want to use it? What's the real consequence of using the model in, in the clinical practice, et cetera? So I think that's a starting point that we should def definitely build upon further in the upcoming year. I see Patrick joining. That's probably the the the, uh, the reason that we should now stop the call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's six o'clock. Uh, so thanks. Thanks, everyone, for the very nice, uh, nice discussion uh, that we had today. And I, I like the idea of these community calls to see people that are not directly involved in the working group that can give some feedback to us. And if you're very interested, you're also in, you're of course invited to join us as well, but uh, thanks a lot for your input and uh, look forward to speak to you more often. Thank you.